Good afternoon, everyone. Very happy to be with you today. We're coming to you from the Trinity Temple Seventh-day Adventist Church in Newark, New Jersey. We appreciate the opportunity that we have to come to you wherever you are. We know that people are watching from all over the city, from other parts of the country, and perhaps from places outside of the United States. We know that you could be watching any service right now, but you chose to be here with us virtually, and we appreciate your uh, giving us this opportunity to serve you. I'm going to ask you if you'll just pray with me as we ask God's blessing upon the message that will be delivered today. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and mercy, and we pray that you will speak to us through this word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're coming down to the end of our series on the book of Hebrews. For the last several weeks, we've been talking about uh, the book of Hebrews and exploring various parts of this very important epistle. This uh, epistle that was actually written to encourage uh, Christians who at one time, at one time had been Jewish believers. They were, uh, many of them were being persecuted. Some of them were being pushed out of their jobs and their occupations. Uh, some were persecuted because of their faith. And some were being intimidated. And some were actually being encouraged to resort to Judaism again. Because uh, it felt like they were not doing well as Christians. That something was missing. And this word came to encourage them in these times of difficulty and challenge. And, and, and we selected this book because I think it speaks to us in this very difficult time of challenge of, of COVID and, uh, and civil unrest that's going on in our society and, and political unrest. Uh, we're in a time when many people are losing faith in the word of God and losing, losing faith in the promise of God. And that's why this book is as important today as it was uh, almost 2,000 years ago when it was written. But we're down to the last chapter, and actually the last part of the book. Um, and we're down to the benediction. When I was a child growing up in church, I loved the benediction. Now, I look forward to the benediction because it signified the end of the church service. And when the benediction was pronounced, we could get up and we could go home. But the truth of the matter is that benedictions in the Bible, and the Bible has some beautiful benedictions, but benedictions are a blessing. A blessing that the, the preacher gives on the congregation. And when you look in the Bible and you read those biblical benedictions, they are such beautiful and often moving benedictions. And this one begins with a request for prayer. In um, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18, it says this, Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably, but I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner. Uh, this, is, this is a wonderful kind of thing uh, to do, to pray for your preacher. In fact, in this month that has been set aside as Clergy Appreciation Month, I just want to tell you as a clergyman that the greatest gift you can give your pastor is to pray for the pastor and his family or her family. Uh, we need your prayers more than anything else. And many of you give other kinds of gifts to show your appreciation in a tangible way, and that's wonderful. But what the clergy need more than anything else is that the members of the church are, are united in intercessory prayer for that pastor and that pastoral family. Because I want you to understand the enemy knows that if he can, if he can kill the head, the body will suffer. And there are trials that ministers and their families go through that many of you have never even begun to imagine. But uh, because uh, it seems as if we live a charmed life. But if we seem to be living so well and doing so well and our children are doing well, it is only because of your prayers and the protective power of God. And so the preacher says, pray for us. Because we are trying to live well. We're trying to live in a good conscience. We're trying to live in a way that you can emulate us. And as Paul said, you can follow us as we follow Christ. Pray for us that we will always be a good example. Pray for us that we will walk circumspectly. And pray for us 
as he says, and I think this is especially important, pray for us that we may be restored to you soon. Uh, pray for us that we can all get together soon. Pray that this plague that is, is going throughout the world will be, will be abated by the Spirit of God and we can come back together and be together again. But he goes on to the benediction. Chapter 13, beginning at verse 20, and I'm going to just read 20 and 22. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. This is what the preacher is asking for. He wants us, he's asking that the people be blessed. And, and he has summed up, in this benediction, he summed up the teachings, the entire teaching of the book of Hebrews because he wants to assure these Christians, these Christians that are being persecuted, these Christians that are being intimidated, these Christians that are having a difficult time every day of their life, he wants to ensure them that God is working out his purposes for them even though they can't see it and even though they're facing difficulties. And so the first thing he prays for, because uh, God, you see, God has a purpose for our lives. I know that sounds kind of trite to some people, but I want you to understand that when you were born, God had a purpose for your life. You may live according to that purpose, or you may choose not to live according to that purpose, but that does not negate the fact that when you and I came into this world, God had a purpose for us that no one else could do exactly like us. And so he says, the first thing I want to do is help you to know that the God is the God of peace. Peace with God is the first step in God doing what he wants to do because when you read on in this benediction, he says that God's purpose is for us to be complete. I'm going to come to that in a little bit. But the first step in being complete or well-equipped, that's a, another translation that says well-equipped or fully armed. The, the first step in that is knowing, is having peace. That is peace with God, peace and contentment. In other words, God is the God of peace and he gives us a peace of mind, not a peace that is without conflict. Some people will think that peace is just the absence of conflict. That's not, that's not the kind of peace that is being referred to here. The kind of peace that's being referred to here is that peace of mind, that peace that comes, that know, that, that comes from knowing that you and God are on the same wavelength, that you are all right with him. As the old people say, it is well with your soul. That is the peace that he's talking about. And this peace this inner, is an inner peace. It doesn't come from the outside. It has nothing to do with what's happening to you. It has nothing to do with whether or not you live in a quiet residential neighborhood or if you live in the middle of the hood where sirens and gunshots are going on all around you. It has nothing to do with whether you are wealthy or whether you are just trying to get by. It has everything to do with the inner attitude. Am I at peace with God? Because I'm going to tell you, it doesn't make any difference how much you have. If you don't have peace with God, you don't have anything. And then he says that the peace is a result of knowledge. <coughs> and he says, peace because of our knowledge of the great shepherd of the sheep. That great shepherd is Jesus. But you see, Jesus is both the good shepherd and the great shepherd. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, the Bible refers to Jesus in two terms. It refers to him as a good shepherd. And Jesus himself said that the good shepherd is the one that lays down his life for the sheep. That's the good shepherd. And Jesus is the good shepherd. He, he came and he lived among us and he took care of us and he protected his disciples. He says, I, I watched over you while I was here. And he laid down his life for every human being that has been born on the face of the earth. <coughs> he laid down his life for his sheep. That makes him the good shepherd. 
But he is the great shepherd because he was resurrected from the dead. That's what makes him great. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep and he's just a dead shepherd who was a good person who protected others. But the great shepherd is the shepherd that came alive again by the power of God and the Holy Spirit and rose from the grave and, and, and has now made, given of evidence that resurrection is not only possible, but it is inevitable for all who have given themselves to him. He is the great shepherd because he's a living savior. He's the great shepherd because we don't worship somebody who lived historically, who died, is buried in a tomb, and we can go visit his tomb and venerate the place his bones are. We, we serve a living Savior, a risen Savior. He's in the world today, and, and he is active in the affairs of human beings, whatever we may think. And he is active in the lives of people, and he is in heaven making intercession for our sins. And so he's not just a good shepherd. He is the great shepherd. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. He is the one who walks with us. He is the one who never leaves us. He is the one who has the power to protect us day and night. He is the one who gives us wisdom when we don't know our way. He is the one who leads us when we are lost. He is the one uh, who comforts us in times of, of terrible grief and pain. He is the one, and he is the one who is now making intercession for us so that even if, it, and, and here's what the Bible says. My children, I write to you that you sin not. But if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. God doesn't want any of us to sin, but if you happen to slip up, We've got the great shepherd of the sheep who makes advocacy. He is our advocate with the Father. He's the one who speaks up for us. He's the one who reminds the Father that blood was shed for us and we receive re forgiveness and redemption through his blood. Now, when we understand how much has been sacrificed to bring us into this relationship with God and what, is, what Jesus Christ is doing for us, that gives us peace of mind. You and I can have peace of mind. We don't have to wonder, are we going to be saved? We are saved. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are saved by the intercession of him on a, on a daily basis, on a constant basis. He is interceding. And one day he will, he will wrap up his work. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that the time will come when he will throw down the censer. He will pronounce everybody uh, 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 who is in the Lamb's book of life saved. And those who are not, well, they will not be. But for his people who love him and who obey him and who pray to him, he is constantly in the business of making sure that we're safe. And if that doesn't give you peace of mind, I don't know what else does. But the, but the apostle is saying that he is praying that we become complete. That's just fully equipped by working with God to protect our character. See, the work of God in our lives is to change us from what we are to what he wants us to be. I need to say that again. The work of God in our lives is to change us from what we are to what he wants us to be. And so it happens in two ways. And, and they've been highlighted all throughout the book of Hebrews. First of all, we have to have faith. And that's why the book of Hebrews talks about the, the role of faith. He says faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of th things not seen because by faith the elders obtained a good report. And the book of Hebrews gives all these examples of people who faced insurmountable and almost impossible odds. And they persevered because they believed the impossible could happen. And God protected and blessed and used them because of their faith. And that's the first thing we've got to believe. We have got to believe that first of all God is. And there are a lot of people who believe that God is or they believe that some higher power is. In fact, uh, it's pretty hard to live in this world and look around and be observant and not believe that somebody, some kind of intelligence didn't create all of this. That's why the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Uh, we believe that, that, that there is a God, but, but here's the thing. 
The Bible says that we have to have faith that believes that he is, first of all, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We've got to believe that God rewards our search. That when we're looking for him and we're seeking to be like him, that he rewards us and, and he changes us from what we are to what he wants us to be. So faith is the first thing that God requires. And then the second thing is submission. Because you see, this thing of becoming complete, God's done his work. Jesus is still doing his work of intercession for us. Now we've got to do our part. And the second part is submission to his will. We believe him, we trust him, we know that he is trustworthy. If we have faith in him, then we have to submit to what he wants us to do. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Submission to him doesn't mean that we are, uh, that we are abdicating uh, uh, of being, enjoying ourselves in the world. Or, but it does say that what I want is not nearly as important as what God commands. It is me taking my desires, my ideals, my, my purposes, my thoughts, my goals and aspirations and laying them at the feet of, of Jesus and saying, Father, lead me. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. I'm willing to lay everything aside to follow you. And you may say to me, like you said to the rich young ruler, you want to follow me, you have to give up all of that stuff and follow me. Or you may say to us, like you said to, uh, uh, to, to Matthew, you want to follow me? Well, you got you, you to gotta divest yourself. You got to try to make up for the wrong that you have done. Whatever God wants us to do, that's what submission is all about. It is deciding that he will be the final authority in everything that we say and do. And the result of that is that we become complete. Uh, we call it sanctification. It is the work of a lifetime. It is the work of character de development. It's the work of changing. It's the work of unfaithful people becoming faithful. It's the work of people who are afraid becoming courageous. It's the work of people who are doubtful becoming full of faith. It's the work of people who don't know the way becoming wise people. It is the work of people who have been weak and timid growing up to become strong and adventurous in God. It is the work of changing us from where we started to where we're going to finish. And we will do those things that please him. And, and that's, what the, that's what, the, what, what the writer ends with. He says that we will do those things that please him. Those things that are working through us that are well-pleasing to him. And here's the thing about it. It won't be a burden to us we'll be on the same wavelength with God. That, that's what he really wants to do. Reconciliation, if, if we understand it properly, we'd be really happy about it. Reconciliation to God and, and following God is not uh, depriving us of anything. It's giving us everything. It's giving us the joy of knowing that our minds and our hearts are tuned to that of the divine and, and, and that we can go through any situation with his help and that we are part, we are thinking like him and following him and we have peace and well-being and we're okay with what he says to do. The result is a change. And that change is sometimes tested. Every one of us is going to have a test at some time. One of the tests of early Christians, Christians right in this time frame and a few years after was martyrdom. Because some Christians were persecuted and they didn't just lose their jobs or have to move to another community and start all over again. They, they were persecuted so much that they, that, that, that they were killed. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, who lived just about 30 years after these words were written. Uh, was the Bishop of Smyrna. The tradition tells us that he was uh, discipled by the Apostle John himself. He was a Christian from the time he was young. 
Uh, he was a man who, who was forthright and godly. But, and, and, and even though persecutions had been raging around him, for some reason the Romans hadn't decided to bother him all of his life until he got into his 80s. And now he's about 85 years old. And the word came out that they were looking for the, for the bishop of Smyrna to kill him. Now, those early Christians who faced persecution and martyrdom were encouraged not to, not to look for martyrdom. You know, some people wanted to just go out and, well, yeah, go on and kill me because I'm, I'm, I want to die for Christ. No, and they said, no, don't, don't do that. Don't look for it. But if it comes to you, don't run from it. And so people encouraged him to leave where he was. And he finally accepted their, their, their advice and he moved out to a country home. And there he was on a Friday evening, and the word came that soldiers were coming for him. And people wanted him to hide out, and he said, no, no, we're not going to do that. So when the soldiers arrived, he, he opened the door and let them in. And, 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 he, and he fed them. He said, listen, you guys have come a long way. I know you're hungry. He gave them food and drink, and he said, well, I, I know I've got to go with you, but, but just let me, let me pray for an hour. The historians say he actually prayed for two hours, but he was praying out loud. And these and these rough these rough warriors who had come to arrest him, when they heard this man pray, asked themselves, "Why, why, why are we arresting this guy? He doesn't need to be arrested." But they had their orders, and so after he finished praying, he went with them. And and the next morning, Sabbath morning, they took him to the arena. And the proconsul examined him and, 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 and said, you know, I can burn you in the fire. And he, and he said, well, you know, yes, but the fire you can burn me in will only burn for a little while, but the fire of eternal uh, damnation burns a lot, a lot hotter and a lot longer. And, I, you know, so this man didn't want, to, didn't want to execute this old man. So he said, listen, uh, would you just, would you just, give a, 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 an obeisance or worship to the genius of Rome. You don't, even have to, you don't even have to pour out a sacrifice to an idol, just the genius of Rome. And the idea of the genius of Rome was that there was, that there was a spirit in Rome that made it so great, and they called it the genius of Rome. And so uh, if he uh, gave, uh, 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 if he acknowledged the, the, uh, uh, the genius of Rome, he was... It was as if he was saying the Roman gods were important and significant in the, in the health and the welfare of Rome. But he says, I, I can't do that. He said, my God has been faithful to me all these years, all these 80 some odd years. How could, I, how, could I, how could I betray him now? And he threatened him and he threatened him and the old man just smiled and he said, you do what you have to do. And they said, we're going to burn you alive. And he said, that's all right. And they took him to the pyre. They had a pole there, and they were going to nail him to it. And he says, listen, you don't, have to, you don't have to do that because God will give me the strength to stand whatever you do to me. And, and sure enough, they executed him by, by burning him. But people who were there said that it didn't smell like flesh burning. It smelled like bread baking. His testimony changed the lives of other people. Some of those very soldiers who were watching him and who had been assigned to bring him in, when they saw this old man suffer bravely for God, they became Christians. And, and, and Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, said the blood of martyrs is seed. Every time somebody stands for God and they suffer for it, more and more people are converted. God may not require you to be to give a sacrifice in of your life. He may not require you to die, but he is going to require you to stand. And that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. If you just stand with God, he will stand with you. And he will bless you. And he will watch you. And he will strengthen you. And he will make you like himself. My appeal to you this, this afternoon is this. God's trying to do something in your life and in mine. Everybody knows that we're not 
the way we're supposed to be. And we're good about saying, well, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Well, nobody is perfect. But we often use that as a way of excusing away the stuff that we know is not right. Many of us don't mind God coming and fixing up a few things and making us look more respectable, but God wants to take over the whole life and change us absolutely 100% and make us different than we were when we started out. That's what some of us have trouble with. But I want to say like the writer to the Hebrews, God's trying to make you complete today. If you just give him your life. If you just be willing to submit to him and say, I want to obey you in all things. He'll show you what you need to do. And he will give you the strength to do it and to stand for it and to be changed. And it won't be a burden. It will be a blessing. That's what I'm appealing to you to give your life to Christ today. And if you're willing to do that, I'm going to ask you if you just, just pray with me as I pray this prayer for you. Father in heaven, I pray for everybody who is watching, everybody who's listening, that hearts may be changed, that lives may be committed to you, and that you, the great shepherd of the sheep, who rose for us, who makes intercession for us, who will one day come and receive us, will guard and guide their way. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. You know, throughout our series on the book of Hebrews, we've been showing how God has been speaking to the, the people of that time, and by extension to the people of our time, people who have been in a very difficult cir circum set of circumstances. We're in a difficult set of circumstances ourselves. And the word is just as meaningful now as it was then. God wants to do something to our lives. God wants to make us complete. He has given us examples of heroes of, and heroines of faith. And he wants to change your life and he wants to change mine. We're just urging you to give yourselves to him. If, if God has spoken to you, and God is telling you you need to make a change in your life. There are directions that come at the end of the services how you can contact us. We urge you to write us, send us an email. Let us know that God is speaking to you. And let us know how we can communicate with you and help build you up in your strength. Remember this. We may not be the way we, we want to be. But if we trust the Lord and give ourselves over to him, he will make us into what he wants us to become. My prayer for you and for me is that we will all be complete as God wants us to be. God bless you and keep you. <laughs>